Uh, I am going to do the guide to budget yarn, a guide. It's going to, I think it's going to be a lot more than one episode because there's a lot to say and there's a lot more than people seem to think there is when it comes to, to making beautiful things on, with very little money. Um, I'm going to go ahead and film that right now. And I'm going to do so and ask you that if it saves you money, if you save 50, 60 bucks buying yarn today or tomorrow by using any of these tips, would you please consider donating some or all of that difference, that savings, to an international relief organization? Obviously, there is no obligation. You don't have to do this. Um, but it's a little thing that we can all do to try to do something, uh, which is better than doing nothing. My hope is that, I don't know, there's a lot of places in the world where things are not so cool. One of the things that makes me so incredibly happy, not happy, but no, yeah, it fills my heart, is that people across Russia are protesting, are saying, whoa, hang on, this is not, no, no, not so cool. And if you protest in Russia, you're very likely to get arrested and possibly never get out of prison. So, you know, that's like a thing. Not, not a small thing to walk out in the street right now and do that. Um, and in all of the neighboring countries, people are opening their doors, their homes literally opening their doors and saying, come on in, stay as long as you need, not a problem. There's lots of refugees in the world. This does not always happen. And I think there's a part of me that hopes that it will change the way that we look at refugees as a whole that we're all going to hopefully come out of this better that we will have learned from the incredible people that are under fire right now so yeah that's what i can do so i'm going to do it it's not much but it's what i got so here we go i don't know i think it startles me occasionally at how expensive people seem to think it is i i've heard on the internet all over the place. Oh, well, I, I knit with acrylic because it's the cheapest thing that I can afford. And an acrylic sweater is gonna cost you 30 bucks and you can absolutely get a fiber, a natural fiber sweater in the same size for the same price. Um, if you choose to use acrylic, that's, that's fine, but it should be a choice made for the properties of the fiber, not for the costs. So I am going to try to bring some of my really just Things I have learned by spending way too much time looking at the internet, looking at yarn, looking at fibers and how they behave and what they can be substituted for. This is all stuff that you can and should do. I am always going to say that knowledge is money when it comes to fiber arts. I have spent my time and my energy into figuring out what are alternatives for creating the garment that I want to create with the look and feel that I want to create um, on a limited budget. So let's start with the thing that is arguably the most expensive, mohair, right? It's doubling your costs. And no matter how reasonably priced the mohair is, you need twice as much yarn. Unless you're a size extra small and you can make a ranunculus out of a skein, which some people can, and good for you, or if you like that, go try it, because apparently that's a thing you can do. Um, and get a nice, a little bit sheer for me, but it's an option that you have if you want to do it. But if you want a double strand with mohair, if you want that halo-y fabric that is hard to replicate, but it's not impossible to replicate, you have options. So, option number one, I am going to show you is made in a chainette yarn. Uh, blown yarns are also going to be very, very, very similar in feel to this. And a, a blown yarn is when there's like a tube and the fiber is blown into it. And then, so there's less fiber used, but you, for a larger gauge yarn, right? Um, which generally makes it more affordable, more accessible. You can have a nicer uh, fiber but there's less of it, so it's a lower price point. This is my sweater number 14, 11, 14, can't remember. One of the my favorite thing sweaters. This is made in a chainette yarn, Lana Grossa Baby Soft. I don't know if you can see the halo 
that it's created. I don't know how close I can go without it being ridiculous. But there is the beautiful halo. There's the fabric that looks kind of unified, right? Like when you look at a mohair sweater, you really don't see the stitches as much. Like if you, if you cable with mohair and you notice the cables look flatter or look less obvious. Um, and it's that same kind of look and feel. This sweater, which is obviously very, very you know, large, this is a, an oversized drop shoulder sweater, um, I believe cost 40, 40 something US dollars. Um, I did, in fairness, score the yarn at Webbs. Uh, I was there and then they have, a, they have a shelf for the super clearance and this happened to be on the super clearance. Um, but you know, go to, go to, go to sales. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Um, have it in the back of your head. Oh, I know that if I want to, this will be good for this kind of project. Even if you don't know the actual project, it's good to have a working idea of how much yardage you might need so that you can in fact buy a quantity without the pattern in your hands and know that you're gonna have enough to make the kind of garment you want. So, option number one is a chainette yarn or a blown yarn. Definitely more economical. You also have things like Drops Air is a blown yarn. Um, Kamaru's, is that how you say it? Kamaru's Sneflug, which is like the coolest name ever, but I don't know how to pronounce it, so. These are all these kinds of yarns and they tend to be better value. Uh, they're not always, but it's worth looking at, right? Um, alpaca in general is another fiber that's going to give you the halo. This is Cloudborn Alpaca and Highland Naturals. I believe a skein of this was six dollars for uh, 247 yards. This has a more stitch definition than something like a blown yarn or a chain eight yarn but has the alpaca content, 50-50, with a highland wool, so it is very soft. Um, some people find alpaca prickly in the way that you might find mohair prickly. So these are, again, not fibers for everybody, but it's a pretty nice alternative. It gives you that same halo. That's my hair. <laughs> the rest of it is halo. Um, so if you're going, if you want a halo-y effect, if you want that soft, buttery garment effect, Another option is an alpaca blend. You can also get lace weight alpaca, right? Which will give you, you know, 800, 900 yards in one skein. And often skeins of alpaca can be had for, I think Isagar Alpaca 1 is, well, I can't remember, but it's a, a thing to check because it's very, I think it's 11 euro a skein and you're gonna get eight or 900 yards, so you need a skein to add to your other wool and get, if you do it with the lace weight, you'd end up with a 50-50. So another option, alpaca. Uh, Isegar has some very good options in alpaca. They have a, this is the undyed colorway in the Cloudborn. They also have the undyed colorway in Alpaca 2, which is the same thing, a 50-50. In fact, the two yarns I'm using in the same sweater, that's how similar they are. Uh, not quite the same, but very similar. I prefer the Isidore by a, a slim margin. It's not quite, this is a little bit puffier, a little bit bouncier. Um, so we, I think, I think the Isagar might be using a lamb's wool, and this is using a, a Peruvian Highland. Could be wrong. Don't actually know. Don't know that the, uh, they say their fiber content. Anyway, I'm rambling. Shutting up. Moving on. Um, another thing that's going to get you the same look as mohair, or very similar, if you're looking for that halo and that warmth, uh, is the Hillesvag yarns. Uh, Tinda and Solia. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly are made with, um, I've completely forgotten what country, Norwegian, Norwegian, right, uh, sheep wool. And it has the most beautiful halo. It, it is spectacular. And the yardage is fabulous. The weight is fabulous and it knits up at a, a higher gauge. Same with mohair where you want to go up a needle size or two because there's room for the fibers to sort of, you know, 
And when you are using a larger needle size, you are getting a less dense fabric, but you are also increasing less yarn. So, Hillersbach Tinda, or Solia. Tinda is the DK weight, Solia is the fingering weight. They might have a chunky weight, I think. Could be wrong, I think they have a chunky weight as well. Um, and it's, it's, it's probably at half the price of knitting with yarn plus mohair. You're just knitting with yarn. A very good option. Um, another option that, eh, okay, if you want visually the look of mohair and the warmth of mohair, Lothalopi gives the same look. The stitch definition is, is, is milder, especially if you're single stranding it. Um, and you're getting that lightweight warmth that you would get from adding mohair to a garment. And you get the halo because of the, 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 the staples in Lopi, you, you get a really beautiful halo. So it is itchier. You know, it is more rustic or however you choose to define that. Um, in fairness, again, some people find mohair to be really itchy. I am not sure I like mohair. I haven't knit with it because I've not had to slash. I feel with alpaca, I sometimes get the hairs and they always seem to find their way into my mouth and that drives me out of my mind crazy. Alpaca does it less or seems to wash away faster. Um, with some of the mohairs, apparently that becomes less of a thing as the garment, you know, is, is washed. But it's an investment that I'm, I have to do a project at some point with just, you know, a small project and see if it would in fact drive me nuts or not because I suspect it might drive me crazy. Um, but I love the look that it gives and I do occasionally try to replicate that. So that's four solid options for having your costs when you want to get a look of that fuzzy, beautiful, lightweight warmth without the price tag. You are also going to want to look at mills. Mills being the place where yarn is produced. And many mills don't just spin for the big yarn companies, they spin local fleece. So there is a decent chance that you will be able to get your hands on some locally produced wool for a very, very, very good price. You can find it by simply Googling. Yeah? Mill, in the name of your state, or the name of your country, or the name of whatever. Uh, mill yarn. These are, these are things you can Google. I was surprised to find uh, two near me when I did this. No idea they were there. The thing to know when buying from a mill, you're going to want to find out what kind of fibers it is and how it's spun. Different yarns are spun in different ways, different spins give you different characteristics, right? Uh, a woolen spun yarn is lighter, loftier, airier, arguably, because it's less dense. Um, a worsted spun is going to give you better stitch definition. So depending on the project you want to make, you are going to be looking at things like yarn spin. A lot of mills in the United States, at least, seem to spin woolen, which for me is really good because I tend to prefer a woolen spun yarn. I like things to be a little bit more on the subtle side. But you're going to find lots of mills that spin lots of different fibers in lots of different ways. And you may very well have one that's an easy drive from your house and save yourself some shipping or one that is in the same country that you are in, or a neighboring country, that the low price of the yarn offsets the minimal cost of shipping from there. Uh, this is certainly true of buying from, if you're in the United States, buying from Canada, Briggs and Little. The thing to know is that obviously different yarns are gonna be different. So Google is gonna be your friend again here in that you are going to want to see what that yarn is like. But People have been knitting with that yarn. If it's been produced, people are going to have talked about it. I have yet to experience Googling a yarn from a small mill and not finding at least a couple of different knitters talking about that yarn, talking about what it's like, what its properties are, whether it's scratchy, whether it's soft, whether it's really durable, what, whatever. 
Because it is not as easy to figure out as it would be where you, you can't just go to Ravelry nine times out of ten. And if you do, maybe no one is actually talking about the yarn. You might be able to see how it looks, but you're not going to get a sense for the feeling of the yarn. But this is also where understanding breeds comes in. The more you know about breeds, the more you can predict what any yarn spun with those breeds is going to be like. Sites like Blacker Yarns, which is a producer of wool and a producer of very, very wonderful wool that I certainly recommend checking out. Um, even if you don't buy anything, they go into a lot of detail in, about different fibers and what their characteristics are. They have a little sheep scale. One sheep is rough but durable, three sheep is the softest. So you get a sense of the soft level, the durability level uh, of, of yarn spun with this fiber. Because it is harder to find the information. Yeah, it is not as easy as well, you can't you can't just walk down to your local yarn shop and, and squeeze it. Maybe you can. Some, some I know that one of my local yarn shops does in fact have some local mill fiber, so I, I can squeeze it there, and I know I'm getting a really sustainable product as well, which is well, that's a nice added bonus, right? But also, the less far yarn is traveling, the, 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 the cheaper it's going to be. So these things certainly come into play. So mills are a great resource. The other reason that mills are a great resource is that they very often sell yarns on cones. Now, a 500 gram cone of yarn usually has 2,500 yards, thereabouts. So even if you were knitting, I think well, for my size, I might be able to squeeze two garments out of that. I certainly can get one garment and a whole bunch of presents, or some accessories. But I think even if you're knitting at the largest size, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't, I don't pay attention. But usually, you notice when you're, you know, right, you're looking at a pattern on Ravelry, and you see the yardage requirements. And usually, I'm sort of in the middle of that. Um, I very rarely see patterns that need more than two thousand yards of fiber. So even if you're knitting the largest size available, you're going to have leftovers, which means that you are paying anywhere between ten and twenty dollars for the yarn for a garment, which is kind of an unbeatable price, right? That is arguably the cheapest way to get yarn. And again, it's really about knowing your fibers. So you look at some place like Wooly Knits, which by the way, I learned about this in the Crea Bea podcast, I've never heard of Wooly Knits before. They're a very economical yarn brand based in the UK. <coughs> and her discount code may still be active, so if you don't follow her, go check that out. Because uh, 20% off is 20% off, right? And that should be run, that maybe the coupon is throughout the cone along, I don't know, but they're doing a cone along to draw people's attention to it, which is kind of awesome. Because again, knitting on a budget, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, different yarns are gonna have different qualities though. And she talks a lot about the woolly wool yarns, which is fabulous because you can watch a couple of her podcast episodes and learn about that yarn. Learn if it's the right yarn for you, learn if it's the right yarn for your project, learn how it's draping because you're looking at it knit up. So podcasters are actually, I find, a really great resource about this. I've learned about a lot of yarns. I learned about Briggs and Little from watching Wet Coast Wools, which was a little yarn shop in uh, Vancouver. Vancouver. They used to do a podcast, and they were hugely informative on what kind of wools uh, they have access to, what kind of wools price range you're looking at when you're looking at these wools. Which, as a side note, a really good local yarn shop doesn't just have expensive yarn. Yes, they will have some hand-dyed merino. You don't want to knit your whole wardrobe out of hand-dyed merino, even if you could, right? You want different fibers for different reasons. Uh, a really good local yarn shop is going to have a wide range of products. They're going to have products for lots and lots of different budgets. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with going into your local yarn shop and coming out with a sweater's quantity of Cascade 220 non superwash. It's a beautiful yarn. It's really, some of them are gorgeously heathered. There, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. There should be no stigma attached to these things. And if there are, t tell yourself to be quiet because it's beautiful yarn. 
it's really always about the qualities that you want in your garment and how do you translate that into yarn? How do you reverse engineer to figure out what kind of yarn you need? And again, knowledge, right? It's, it's good to know these things. But cones of yarn can be had. I think woolly knits, I, was, I did look at them because I had never heard of them before. And I think that their cones were 20 quid, 25 quid, um, which is 30 US dollars. So even when you include shipping, you're probably still only paying 25 or 30 US dollars for one sweater. And then obviously you're getting other things as well. Um, it's a great value. It, you know, you're, you're paying for shipping, that's a thing. Um, but very often it is cheaper, especially because of the, the I, I guess it's because of the thresholds. European yarn is more expensive in the States. Back to yarn cones. You can very often get them directly from mills as well. Yeah, there are mills all over lots and lots of countries. Uh, I'm assuming all over the world because I know that there are Japanese yarns uh, and they have to come from somewhere. So I'm assuming there must be mills in Asia as well. Uh, but all over the US, Canada, even in Mexico, there's a mill. I found a mill. I didn't want to buy the yarn. It was more leaning towards rug situation. The, 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 the smallest gauge that they sold was it was was basically a heavy Aran weight, which and, and it was a very dense looking fiber. It was really cool looking, but you know, not I don't, I don't know what I would make with it. Anyway, I'm digressing again. What is with me today? Cones are a really great value, but there are also larger brands that do things on cones. Uh, Willy Nets being one of them, and there is a wealth of information on that particular brand. There's a couple, there's a, there's, a, there's a bunch of mills in England. And again, you're gonna pay for shipping, but get a couple of cones of yarn, get some friends together, and each get a cone of yarn, and you're still gonna be dropping your costs significantly over buying a similar fiber anywhere else. But if we're talking about cones, the people to talk about would be Holst because they are the maestros. They have a, what, what you would call a workhorse yarn, which I don't know how I feel about that name because it implies that it's somehow like lower class. I don't, I don't, I don't know, maybe I'm overthinking this. That's always a possibility, but um, they make really beautiful yarns. They make Coast, which is a cotton blend and drapes beautifully. They make Noble, which is 5% cashmere, which I have not knit with yet, but it is definitely on my list, and I know what I want to make with it if I ever... They didn't have the color that I wanted the last order I placed, so it's... It's gonna be happening. Uh, they have Super Soft, which is the original, which is your 20 euro cone thing. Again, that would make you, what, a $15 sweater, maybe? And they're beautiful yarns. Um, the other thing to know about cones is that most likely it's going to come with spinning oil. So you are going to, if it bothers you, if the smell bothers you, or the feel bothers you, you can wash it. You can, you know, put it into a hank, tie the hank together, submerge it in water with a little, you know, wool soap. Treat it like you would treat a garment, only it's the yarn before you've used it and then skate it up and go, right? And start knitting, cake it up and start knitting. Uh, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother a lot of people. So it's 50-50 who, or, you know, it, it either will bother you or it won't. Um, it also, some people say it makes their hands feel really nice. Well, uh, the other thing to note when you are working with yarns off cones is that processing the yarn, getting rid of the spinning oils, getting rid of the, the everything, is gonna make the yarn bloom often a lot. So if you are knitting on a with a cone of yarn, block your swatch. Put it in a bath, take it out, lay it somewhere to dry, wait until it's fully dry, because sometimes you just think it's gonna keep growing, it's crazy. Um, and you're gonna see a totally different fiber and it's gonna behave totally differently. Yes, whole super soft is maybe not the softest yarn you've ever used, 
but it's certainly not the scratchiest. And as you wear it, as you wash it, it just gets softer. So it's a garment that maybe that's why they call it a workhouse, because a decade from now, you're still going to be wearing it. It's still going to look beautiful, and it's going to be a lot softer. Some people also swear by the Dawn dish soap trick or the hair conditioner trick. There are lots of things you can do to soften up wool a little bit. I've never tried these, so I can't speak to it, but it's a thing people do, and if you want your wool to be softer, even if you paid like, you know, $600 for the wool, you might want the wool to be softer. Again, price is not always reflective of quality. It's reflective of how much it costs to produce it, how much it costs you know, Cloudborn is cheap because they don't advertise. You, they, don't, they don't have pattern designers on staff making patterns for the yarn to showcase the yarn. That costs a lot of money. A lot of other companies do. They advertise, they do all of these things, that's all built into the price of the yarn. Not so much when you buy from a mill, not so much when you buy on cones. So thinking about how to get the best value Shipping is a thing. Shipping is not free. Shipping from Europe, however, is so much cheaper than shipping around the United States. You might find that it would cost you less to ship from a local yarn shop in England than it would cost you to ship from a local yarn shop in the United States, which is crazy, but I guess they have better shipping. I, I don't know how that works. I just know that it's true. I am, in fact, almost more likely to order yarn from the UK or the EU than I am to order it from here, which is what it is. But don't rule something out just because you're assuming. Because the assumption might not be true. So I think that's enough for this round. We got alternatives to mohair, we got buying directly from mills, and we've got a whole variety of options of yarns on cones. I'm also going to, on the end screen, put some brands to look out for, because there's lots and lots of brands. A lot of them are from Europe. European yarn does tend to be cheaper. Um, but there's a lot of brands that have really tremendously fabulous wool for very reasonable prices. Yeah? Knitting with Olive makes a non-superwash merino, and a sweater's quantity for me is definitely going to be under 50 US dollars. So, and that's merino. It's not hand dyed, but it is merino. So lots and lots of beautiful options at lots and lots of price points. Do you have to look a little harder? Maybe. Is it worth it? Thanks for watching. I'll see you later.